Bienvenido al primer webinar de World of Financial Symposiums para América Latina. Soy Jason Stebley, analista del Grupo Quorum. Durante el seminario, los panelistas van a hablar en inglés con diapositivas en español. Si tienen preguntas, utilice el apartado de comentarios a la derecha de su pantalla. Hi, Jason Stebley, Research Analyst with the Quorum Group. Welcome to the first World Financial Symposiums webinar for Latin America. America. In this webinar, our panelists will speak in English with slides in Spanish. If you have questions, please use the comments box at the right of your screen. World Financial Symposiums is an international organization dedicated to software and technology M&A with the intent to educate executives and stimulate deal flow among colleagues in the industry through monthly webinars and its flagship quarterly one-day conference, Growth and Exit Strategies for Software and IT Companies. We're proud to be the platinum sponsor of the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight Series, which focuses on specific technology sectors and markets. And today's webinar, coming events include Market Spotlights on casual games in August and uh, on health software and technology in September. And we hope you can join us in Silicon Valley for the next Growth and Exit Strategies Conference. The Corp is a global leader in M&A services for software and information technology companies worldwide. With offices in eight countries, Quorum has facilitated over $6 billion in M&A transactions spanning six continents. Well, here, Quorum has a special interest in Latin America due to the region's strong growth, technology culture, and international activity. When I was in Go City last March, I was impressed by the quality of the technology companies we met. Since we I have been even more impressed by the intense interest our American clients have received from European and North American buyers. In a, in a moment, we'll hear a complete report on tech M&A in Latin America. America, but the agenda also includes eight steps on how to sell your company for an optimal outcome by Quorum CEO Bruce Milne and a short Q&A session if there is time. Now let's turn to Quorum's Vice President in, uh, in Houston, Jeff Brown, our gateway to Latin America. Oh, buenos dias. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Tech activity is building in Latin America since the beginning of 2009. And over 200 transactions have been closed in the region. The booming economy and robust tech industry have led the way, but a healthy amount of deals have been recorded across the entire region. If we look on Brazil at the Spanish-speaking countries, we see a good mix of deals with clear opportunities for growth, leading are Argentina, Mexico, and Chile. In the source, Central American countries are generating deals. A particular note is Costa Rica with four punching well above its weight when comparing the number of deals to the size of its economy. So deals are getting done, but where are the buyers coming from? Well, they're coming from everywhere. So only a quarter of the buyers of Latin American technology companies are actually located in Latin America, Stephanie Brazil being one of the most active. North America and the U.S. firms in particular are the primary buyers. We see significant interest from Europe, too, we also expect Asia's portion of the deals to increase over the next few years, as Chinese technology firms in particular get more aggressive. And we know from public statements that the Indian IT services giants like Wipro are already targeting Latin America for expansion. This is a surprise to us here at Quorum. We are active in Latin America and currently have a client under LOI. Recently, rough 70% of our completed transactions have been cross-border. So our routes actually line up quite well with the entire Latin American M&A marketplace. The fact that 75% of the buyers in Latin America are located on a different continent can create a challenge when looking to sell your firm if you do the global community of prospective buyers. Deals have been mostly in the telecom sector, but a number of major deals from other tech domains may be of more interest to our audience today. American equity firm Apex Partners recently spent half a billion dollars for control of Brazilian IT outsourcer Tivit at roughly a billion dollar valuation, a multiple of 1.8 times revenue. The piece are opening up to Latin America, and we cross paths with them regularly as we continue looking for deals in the region. A large deal, Irish Experian Group took private Columbia's Computech, a services information provider provider for $400 million, a healthy multiple of 4.7 times revenues. They give us a real sense of the possibilities for mid-sized firms in the market. Let's quorum's six 
its market sectors to see what else is driving acquisitions of Latin American companies. Not surprisingly, IT services has made up the bulk of the deals. Latin America is well positioned to provide cost-effective services to North America and Europe to become an attractive nearshore option for their northern neighbor. This is what's going to drive Indian and Chinese buyer interest as well. Brazil's Stanini has been active with seven acquisitions recently, roughly one every five months with four in South America and three in North America. As Benini and Apex activity indicate, Brazil dominates this sector, making up about two thirds of the deals. But they're not the only buyers. Riverwood Capital acquired Chile's Synapsis from energy firm Enersys for two million, looking to exploit its expertise in the energy field. In the corner of IT services, French company Publix Group, a top four acquirer last year, just picked up Costa Rica's Boz Digital a web design and marketing services firm, also in the process of acquiring sister company Bob Digital of Columbia, and they'll continue their long-term strategy of global expansion via acquisition. In fact, yesterday, they announced a $35 billion merger with U.S.-based Omnicom. The next purchase segment has been the vertical market applications. Here, financial tools make up a significant piece of these, nearly half, in fact. May, for example, CCH, a Walters Tour business focused on tax and accounting, a accounting ERP provider, Prodoft of Brazil, both tend geographically and to enhance their cloud technology. These two motions, tech and regional expansion, draw many of these cross border deals. Other vertical markets include healthcare, engineering, pharma, and government. In one example last year in Argentina, Japan's NEC picked up Global VSA, a provider of video surveillance services to government. Infrastructure M&A in Latin America primarily involves physical infrastructure, including towers and ISPs. But there are opportunities for software and services as well. Last U.S.-based Romeware picked up Argentina's ASEF, a provider of wireless infrastructure testing tools. This example of a drill driven of a deal driven primarily by technology. As I have added critical tools to Romeware's portfolio. Reach secondary factor in this one. The actor has been consolidation has seen consolidation along the uh, Groupon style coupon services providers, with firms across the US, Europe, and Latin America making five separate deals in Chile, Mexico, and Brazil, all kicked off by Groupon's own acquisition of Clans Guanto in 2010. Media, a modest online network of media and entertainment websites serving Hispanics, has actually been the most has done the most deals in Latin America of any buyer, with such deals between 2011 and 2013 in both net and consumer sectors. Metrobug.com of Argentina is a blogging software platform targeting Hispanic consumers. It fits neatly into the Batanga strategy. With five bills in 2011 and a sixth a couple of months ago, Batanga may well be starting another sprint through a series of acquisitions. Horizontal offerings coming out of Latin America than those built with a vertical focus, in part an indication of the difficulty of building really horizontal solutions. However, innovation can come from anywhere, and technology and talent is always valuable. Mostly, Canada's Freeport Capital took control of mobile marketing and communication startup Mobi 724 of Argentina to let mobile tech. And in the human capital management space last year, Career Builder, one of the top employment websites in Latin America, save of Brazil. The consumer applications market the transactions have been driven by the Batanga spree. There have a number of gaming acquisitions, including Japan's DA acquiring Atacama Labs, a venture-backed gaming company in Chile, as one piece of a larger global expansion strategy. What's the lesson from all of this? Well, Latin American technology firms can deliver value for a number of reasons. Technology, talent, and reliable revenues are valuable wherever they're located. Into this because Latin America provides regional and linguistic assets too. Up to Patanga is targeting Latin America for expansion, if it 
expansion or a bear is embarking on a global strategy such as Publis Group or DNA, a successful technology company can add additional value on top of their intrinsic worth as a software company. One of the challenges for, Latin American, for the Latin American market has been the difficulty in making those buyer-seller connections. Most deals appear to have been driven almost entirely from the buy side, with the buyer outreach and setting the terms. Sitting for this to happen is not the path to an optimal outcome, as we'll see. In addition, the typical buyer of a Latin American firm is not a major company like Google or Microsoft with the resources to do their own research and search. With some notable exceptions, these buyers tend to be mid-sized companies grabbing opportunities where they're available. For some in Latin America to truly make the most of their value, they need to be proactive about being well-positioned and doing a global search for the right buyer. Too frequently, the one you've never heard of or considered and they've never heard of you either. Next, Bruce will be discussing this topic in more detail. Bruce? Go ahead. Uh, I see there's a question about Spanish versions versus English versions. These slides are in Spanish for the benefit of our audience, which is primarily Latin America, uh, a bit in Spain, Buenos Dias, and Latin America, Buenos Noches in España. Uh, we have an English version. If you would like to get those slides, I will send them to you. I'm Bruce Milne, CEO of the Quorum Group. Uh, it's been my pleasure working in Latin America for most of my life. I went to school in Mexico City. Uh, I've done some landmark work with uh, firms like DataSul in Brazil. Uh, we've done transactions with firms like BBVA. We see Latin America as one of the top two growth markets in the world, along with China. A uh, number of reasons for that, as we saw in Jeff's presentation. Uh, at the top of this, though, is cash. Cash, cash, cash. The property firms have over $1 trillion, much of it earmarked for national expansion. And the technology companies, these strategic buyers, the Microsoft, the Cisco's, et cetera, of the world, have over $350 billion. But here's what is not so well known. Most of that money, over 70%, is outside the United States. Over a quarter of a trillion dollars is out of the United States and has to be invested for tax reasons in foreign companies. That's why we see an explosion of activity potentially coming up in Latin America. But how to sell your company, as Jeff said, 75% of the buyers will be outside Latin America, companies you've never heard of. So let's talk a little bit about the process, because there's some inherent problems. They're diametrically opposed in everything when you go to do a transaction. Buyers lower price, you want a higher price. You want a structure that's going to work for you tax-wise, minimum liabilities, you want non-competes. The buyers have completely different views. How do you bring that together? And the process today is tough. Um, because of the drafts in the dot-com era and the recent recession, there's been more regulations by every government in the world, uh, military environment here in the United States is Sarbanes-Oxley. You have to go through a much tougher due diligence. There's more tasks than people realize. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But since the searches for a partner have to be global, you have to think about more that you have to do in terms of getting connected and getting them to make the offers you want. Buyers are busy. They're looking at hundreds of transactions. We just had a record quarter last quarter. We're seeing more activity than ever, uh, and most of the deals are for cash. Type professionals. You saw firms like Arthur Anderson go under. Some of your law firms went under during the dot-com crash because they were involved in liability issues. And they're tougher on due diligence. How do we get through that? Let's talk about that. Uh, complex due diligence, naturally, and then deal fatigue. If there's more work and there's more outside parties involved, there's more wear and tear, how do we get through that? So it's an optimal outcome. This is the process that Quorum has developed in selling more companies than anyone in history. These are privately held software or related technology companies. These are begin end transactions. They're, we didn't just come in and do a, you know, analysis or some negotiation or a fairness opinion. All transactions are from beginning to end. And all the held uh, sellers, for the most part, almost all the held a few public companies. So how do you create an optimal outcome? And what is an optimal outcome? Well, first, the how do you maximize value? And maybe even more important than that is structure. What will be the structure of the transaction? Is it going to be all cash or all or not? What do you want? I'll take cash, by the way. Optimize personal risk and liability. Uh, if any of you have been on a website, and I encourage you to do that at quorumgroup.com, 
There's a video of people who recently sold their company up celebrating with us in Alaska. And there is uh, in one of the segments there, a lady who sold her company, actually sold two companies with us. She said, I thought it was all about price and structure. It was all about liability. That's where we spend all of our time. So how do you handle liability? Taxes. We have to think about taxes. Globally, where? How do we think about taxes? Because And how do you handle? Because what the buyer wants may be diametrically opposed to what's best for you tax-wise. And in fact, it can triple your taxes if not done properly. Employment agreements. What are the standards? And what are the standards if you have a European buyer, an Asian buyer versus, say, an American buyer? What do you expect? And then how do you integrate? How do you make these transactions work? You don't want to be one of the statistics of failed deals, which is over 53%, according to Ernst & Young. Our transactions, we found, are some of the best integrated in the world, but there's, you have to get ready to do it right, okay? So what are eight steps for an optimal outcome? Well, first off, we look at preparation, and then <clears throat> research, contact, discovery. It's a term that we, we borrowed from the legal community. And negotiation, due diligence. Finally, integration. Let's take a closer look at these. I slide Spanish. My commentary will be in English, and I'll be glad to answer your questions in either language. I see we have a couple of questions. First operation is so crucial. When you go out to a global marketplace, you're dealing with A and B level buyers. They have lots of questions, and you have to be ready. Uh, you know what, the, what things they ask, what the tasks, how do you allocate your staff resources, you know, how do, do, what kind of business and marketing plans will they need from you? Uh, how, what type of internal due diligence do you have to do to get ready? Um, how do you write financial projections and presentations? And how do you begin collecting due diligence that will later be put into a data room? Research. Where are you really in the, in the environment? Who might want to buy you? Who's your competition? You have to perform strategic analysis on each buyer. The way to get maximum value is by understanding the fit here, and you have to start with knowing your company, obviously, but also knowing the buyers and how that will, how will strategically fit. You need to have some sense of play valuation, so at least you have agreement internally. Then the proper contact. You know, who do you contact in these companies? A few firms, you have to make electronic submissions. Some firms, there's a one, simple, one central gateway. In some, you have to go through the divisions. You have to know who to contact. What type of cited boards, advisors, and influencers are there in each of these buyers? What will be the process? There's a lot of people involved, any one of which can kill the deal. Who's going to be involved on the other side? And what's your mission statement for each buyer? Each buyer has a unique set of demands and needs with your company. Are they? Finally, contacting people, introductory correspondence, uh, executive summaries, NDAs, special interest, valuation expectations. What are they looking for? And step in all communications. This will be absolutely crucial. And refine your position process based on feedback. You will learn an extraordinary amount from this process. And then we, once you started to get into your under NDA and there's interested parties, now we have the discovery process where we're really getting down into it. Conference calls, site visits, established technology review process. How do you control that? <coughs> How things confidential? Prepare formal evaluation report for the buyer. Develop synergy and contribution analysis. Set up NDAs with customers and contractors, for example, because you have some of these situations, some of these in place in order to do final due diligence, and then finish due diligence on the buyer. Now, this is due diligence that is being done, discovery that is being done by the buyer to then make an offer. So at that point, now we're getting into negotiation. Host final visits, provide structure and valuation guidance, create an auction environment. An auction environment is absolutely crucial. How do you end up getting up to 50% more on these transactions? Actually, the number is 48% more. Well, the reason you do is a lot of it's through the auction environment, how you handle the buyers. For example, who is the first party you contact, the one that knows you the least or the one that knows you the most? All right. right. Negotiate with top bidders. Set, set intent. Sign your letter of intent. Go into no-shop. Inform other bidders of this no-shop. Now we're into the formal due diligence leading up to a contract and closing. To verify financial statements, determine outside advisors or opinions that might be needed, Fairness opinion, for example, uh, opinions perhaps on technology, establish confidential data room, and then you have to deal with technical, legal, and ownership issues, due diligence issues, uh, explanation of the business model, and complete definitive agreement. The diligence and the definitive agreement are being done at the same time. Closing. There's a 
reps and warranties, representations and warranties. You know, what, are, what will they re- require of you post-closing? And what will be the conditions for returning money or traveling the deal? Determine escrow, holdbacks, any opinions, legal opinions that may be required, and contracts, arrange payment and distribution, regulatory filings, uh, disclosure schedules. You know, this is the this is the time when, when things can fall apart at the very end here if not handled, all the T's crossed, the I's dotted. Integration. And this is something that we at Quorum spend a great deal of time on with our clients because you want to do this transaction and find out that it didn't work, that the employers are happy, nobody's happy with you. It's planning. You need to think about it during the uh, during the process and in negotiation. Determine energies. Do best practice analysis. Uh, having transactions in transition team. Excuse me. Employee retention plan. How do we keep those employees, those key employees, and how do we set up a monitoring reporting system to make sure this works? A lot of work, all right? Uh, typically, at Core, we have 700 to 1,000 contacts. We keep uh, of all these in our client activity reports. So it takes 9 to 12 months because of the work- workload. Uh, we can get interest sometimes in just a few weeks, but not 12 months of time uh, because even if, you're, even if we had an offer today, we still have to get through final due diligence, fine co- final contract, lawyers, accounts, etc. It's about three to five man years of work, both in-house and outside, including both sides of the transaction, buyer and seller. So this is a full-time job. Get ready for it, and you get somebody on your side to help out. So what benefits? What we found in this is it's, it's, a, it's a very unique process. It's the only time you have a chance to go to the the top, and uh, what we found is that if you if you do this properly, um, you have you go to on a global search. About 75% of the time, there will be some other party willing to pay more than the first party that approached you. Because I know a lot of you have talked to us and you said we've been approached, and I just want to try and work that one party. That actually is not the way to go, because usually the first person to contact you is contacting you because they're trying to get the lowest price. If you leverage and you go on a global search. 75% of the time, the somebody else willing to pay more. How much more? On average, 48%. So that means the only time you get a chance to go directly to the top. A lot of times in our businesses, I've owned four software companies. I've sold my software companies. I've been involved in over 300 sales. And the problem, oftentimes people go in at the lowest level. They know the divisional managers are doing licensing or reseller agreements. Or maybe you go in a, a joint venture uh, process. You know, somebody doing some joint venture marketing, technology, whatever. But there's one time, there is one time when you can go CEO of every public company in the world, and that is with a message, do you want to buy my company? And why do that? It's because these are builders. If you look at the CEOs of all these major companies, they're basically building empires through acquisitions. Uh, Microsoft, Oracle, Cisco, all these companies are essentially a collection of acquisitions. The name game is mergers and acquisitions. We've seen the growth and resurgence of Yahoo. Guess what? Yahoo is a top buyer this year. So looking for your company, they're looking for firms that have position and user bases in other parts of the world, technologies they can use, or perhaps this development capability, technology being developed all over the world in different locations. So there's five major benefits of this process that come if you do this right. One is by going through this properly and professionally, you will, with a preparation process, will help you forge a much better business model for your firm. We're in this over and over. Not everyone sells right away, we've found, but being a better business model, they end up being much stronger and more valuable long term. The research, your strategic position is honed. You understand your competition, wires want. So a much better posi- sense of your market position. Here's one that's very interesting, is market feedback. When you talk to the whole world and tell your story, you get extraordinary feedback because these companies on the other side have spent a lot more money in some of these markets than you have. You will learn a lot from the dialogues whether or not you ever open doors for some kind of a relationship. And the relationships, it's very interesting. We've learned this from the very beginning. Seventy percent of the parties that go under NDA to buy you actually maybe can't buy you or won't buy you, but they may be partners in some other fashion. They help you build value. And, of course, the fifth benefit is exit, merger, sale, investment, financial recapitalization of your company. Any one of these, any one of these benefits, any one of the five, 
justifies the effort and expense of going through this process. Close with one story here. We have just a couple of minutes. This is a case study, and I, I picked this one particularly because a lot of the folks who are online here with this are smaller firms. Here's a company that had $3 million in revenue. I got two offers for them in the $5 to $8 million range, which was at the time about what they expected, a little bit above that. Now, here sometimes happens. One of the reasons they, they, they fell apart because, uh, because they, are, they had a problem with the stock market. So they wanted to issue stock, and they couldn't do that. In the other case, this will happen to some of you, with Champion, company on it, on the side. And they, I can't remember what happened, doesn't really matter, but they left or they were promoted. So we lost our Champion, and we had to restart. Well, at that point, went into a process we've learned is very beneficial, and that is hiatus. Sometimes you lot, maybe you get offers, maybe you don't. Uh, take the knowledge gained, uh, the market, the research, the market feedback, et cetera, the, and the positioning better business model. There was this process of, called hiatus. Basically, you go off the market, you continue to nurture the dialogues, as they did. And they ended up doing about four or five ventures out of this, uh, which built their value. We took them back to market. This is that, you know, not everybody's a buyer kind of thing, but they may be partners. We t opened some of those doors. Uh, built some value, and then we took them back to market about 18 months later, um, and we ended up selling to a equity firm uh, for 90 percent, about 90 percent of the value of around 40 million. Two year, they sold it for 100 million. So the company that started off being happy with five million dollars as a minimum price, ended up getting let's see, 90 percent of 40 is what's that work out to? Uh, about 40 million. What do we get? About 50 million dollars? Yeah. There's just under, 50, just under $50 million for the company. So that's how you do the process in one sort of simple example. We're at uh, 27 minutes in. We have a couple of minutes uh, for, uh, for questions. I, I see we have a couple of questions. Um, one is about uh, Tim. Tim, by the way, has spent a lot of time in Latin America, and the question is about how will we get these versions to them, the Spanish and the English version. A couple of requested uh, copies of the slides in Spanish or in English, and we will definitely reach out to you. If you do uh, want that, you can either um, make a note in the Q&A right now, or if you uh, send us an email afterwards, we'll have an email address up on the screen shortly to uh, make those requests, and we'll get them to you in either or both languages. Uh, this is kind of a comment that I did cover already, why Latin America now, um, and, and about size of companies. actually. We're seeing companies even at zero revenue uh, be getting interest. You're probably seeing deals these days that are being done with just a new technology and idea. So we are seeing that. Uh, they're very interested in Latin America in uh, user bases and in using your firm with feet in the street user bases down there, et cetera, where they can help to transfer some of their technology, uh, perhaps uh, lower cost R&D, as we're finding R&D centers can be all over the world. Uh, there's a lot of benefit in international transactions. Uh, most of your buyers will be outside Latin America, about 75%, probably a little bit more than that. Um, uh, some of how big are the companies? We, so they're privately held firms, and so they, they run up to a couple hundred million dollars, but the average privately held firm is, is millions, five, 10, 15 million dollars, that sort of thing. They sell for, uh, you know, for one to 10 times revenue. I would encourage you to attend our monthly webcasts, which are the first is it first or second Thursday of the month? And we date all of the basic markets, the market metrics. So take at that, look at our annual or semi-annual broadcast to go into all 26 sectors if you want more information on valuations of what they're being paid for these days. I would, I would encourage you also, we will be coming to Latin America with a series of live events in all the major capital cities uh, this fall, and I look forward to seeing many of you at that event. I we're right at the 30-minute mark. Uh, uh, Seth Cost, you asked about uh, do we normally work on the buy side or sell side? We do a little bit of buy side work in Latin America simply because of the nature of the, of the, of the, of the market. But most all of our clients are sell side. We don't work with competing firms. Uh, they are privately held for the most part. Many are venture-backed, as you can imagine. So we work with venture and private equity firms in the world. And if you look at our, our, in our, uh, on our website, you'll see more transactions than anyone's ever done in history. And there's a lot of those. We've done a few billion dollars with private equity firms. We know all these firms well. We've sold both to them and for them. Uh, this broadcast, I think, would this broadcast be online? 
Okay, that's the last question. The broadcast will be online. Uh, and so how would they how would they access that, Tim? We'll put online at WFS.com uh, just later today or, or possibly tomorrow. Hey, we're at 30-minute mark. Thank you very much for attending. And please get hold of us uh, through the WFS, which we support and help sponsor, WFS.com or quorumgroup.com, www.quorumgroup.com. Thank you very much for attending.